This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Lively and stimulating presence uh, with us. Um, uh, she, she came as leaving human trust to visiting fellow in, in the School of Advanced Study. Um, what she's working on at the moment is a book manuscript which is entitled Empires of Design Austria, Britain, and the Global Consumption of Modernity, 1850 to 1950. So she obviously comes from a background in German studies, Austrian studies, art history, and history, and as well as her academic work or connected with She's uh, also worked as a curator in the art department of the City Museum of Vienna. Uh, one of the exhibitions she worked on was uh, Vienna 1932, a model of the new building of Verkunst. Which we'll be talking about today. Which we'll be talking about today, excellent. Um, so, uh, let me just give you the title. Um, which we uh, read out for you, as tradition for this, you can see it. Modern Homes in the Making, Otto Neurat, Josef Frank, and Anglo Austrian social housing. Great. Thank you so much, Bill, and thank you to everyone for coming out on this chilly evening. Um, I'm really happy to have this opportunity to present some new material I've been working on this year in London um, and some old material that I've been able to recast over the year. What I'd like to do this evening is discuss the theories and practices of architecture and design that emerged in Red Vienna which is the name given to the period from 1919 to 1934, when Vienna was run by a social democratic city council. Had they culminated in the Verkundsiedlung housing estate of 1932, and then conclude by talking just briefly about how these discourses and architectural types would resurface in 1940s Britain. But in order for us to have a closer look at the aesthetic and political impulses behind social housing initiatives in Red Vienna, I think it's worth looking briefly at the Austrian imperial state um, in the few decades before the onset of the First World War, just so that we can visually contextualize the differences in city planning after the war. The turn of the century marked the golden age of Viennese culture, as many of you might know it. At least this is how the intensely nostalgic uh, tourist industry of the Austrian capital likes to market itself today. The Habsburg monarchy had endured a long and complex history, having been in power in Central Europe since 1278. Members of the family had ruled the Holy Roman Empire, and in 1867, they responded to increasing nationalism in the Crown lands by transitioning into the parliamentary state of Austria-Hungary, an attempt at diplomacy that granted greater autonomy to Hungary. The empire was a vast, contiguous state that was defined by its defiance of ethnic and linguistic boundaries, as you can see, sort of the marbleized colors in this map. Um, and it's comprised of sizable chunks, if not all territory, of present-day Austria, Bosnia, Croatia, Czech Republic, Hungary, Italy, Poland, Romania, Serbia, Slovakia, Slovenia, and Ukraine. And according to the figures given by Istvan Dejak in his book Beyond Nationalism, which is, I think is a really excellent study of um, multiculturalism in the empire, um, by 1910, only 23.3% of the Austrian population was considered to be ethnically German. Ethnic Hungarians accounted for 19.6% of the population, followed by the Czechs with 12.5%, Poles 9.7%, and Serbs and Croats with 8.5%. The remaining imperial subjects fell mostly into the following ethnic categories, Italians, Romanians, Ruthenes, known states Ukrainians, Slovaks, and Slovenes, among others. Now, Vienna of the mid to late 19th century has become emblematic in the history of modern urban planning, and this is due largely to the promotion of historicism on the part of local and imperial authorities. I should add that when I say historicism, I'm referring to a style in architecture, design, and the fine arts, which borrows motifs and structural elements from different time periods, 
often with the aim of establishing a seemingly organic continuity between the past and the present. And this is different from the predominantly German school of thought that um, Deepesh Chakraborty examines critically in his book, Provincializing Europe. The brand of historicism that I am talking about right now is an aesthetic practice of revivalism that was inextricably tied to the development of the Ringstrasse, the grand boulevard that had replaced Vienna's medieval city walls and been opened ceremoniously on May 1st, 1865. So here are just two examples of major buildings uh, of the Ringstrasse. So we have the neo gothic Rathaus and the Neo-Baroque Borg Theater. Um, and this is a view outside of my Zimmer apartment in Vienna. Um, and this is just very typical for um, historicist housing in the 1880s. I believe this, um, these buildings are from around 1881. In the seminal book, A Late Imperial Vienna, Fondesia Vienna, Politics and Culture, Karl Schorsky wrote about the practical reasons for the development of stylistic eclecticism. The pace of social change had run too fast for the development of art to match it. Unable to devise a style to express modern man's needs and outlooks, architects stretched up all past historical styles to fill the void. By the 1890s, however, critical voices against historicism started to emerge, giving birth to the movement that has come to visually define the decadence of turn of the century Vienna. The defiant cries of the architect Otto Wagner, who um, did these um, these apartment buildings on the Lincoln Sala, um, led to his becoming the godfather of the secession, which we see their exhibition space um, and then a detail on the bottom. And the secession was the artist group that broke the Academy of Fine Arts in 1897. Um, Wagner was also the prolific teacher of many of the architects who would go on to redesign the city as a socialist metropolis in the 1920s. The secessionist motto, Der Zeit ihre Kunst, der Kunst der Freiheit, to each age its art, to art its freedom, demanded the articulation of a new art that was liberated from the past and deliberately anti-historical in style. Although the secession represented a critical rupture with the artistic establishment, the liberal imperial government was keen to participate in this new mode of Austrian self-expression. In 1899, the Ministry of Culture and Education created an Arts Council with the intended purpose of furthering the ahistorical, non-vernacular, and hence universal qualities of modern art in order to unite the many peoples of Austria-Hungary. Artists, academics, and political figures served on the council, and they articulated that modernism would serve as a common visual language for the multilingual inhabitants of the Habsburg Empire with its abstracted motifs and clean lines, functioning as an integrative idiom of expression that was in opposition to the development of national styles. This resulted in the official patronage of many modern Austrian artists and accounts for the flourishing of Viennese Art Nouveau, or Jugendstil as it was called in the German-speaking lands, and the painter Gustav Klimt, who I assume all of you are very, all too very familiar with, um, is probably the most famous beneficiary of this program. Nevertheless, as Shorsky has indicated, while other European governments still shied away from modern art, the ancient Habsburg monarchy actively fostered it. And Berti Zuckerkandl, one of the foremost art critics of turn of the century Vienna, alluded to this deep connection between modernism and Austrian imperial identity in her autobiography written in the 1930s. She wrote, Enthusiastically, I followed this secessionist slogan into action. It was a question of defending a purely Austrian culture, a form of art that would weld together all the characteristics of our multitude of constituent peoples into a new and proud unity. For to be Austrian did not mean to be German. Austrian culture was the crystallization of the best of many cultures. And I think that these two statements, Shorsky and Sokokhan, um, are key in thinking about the close relationship between municipal policy and innovations in Viennese art and design, which would go on to be central to the forging of a socialist post-imperial <coughs> Austrian identity in the 1920s. By 1903, several key figures had left the secession, frustrated that the group's main focus on the fine arts was betraying the contemporary relevance of design and production. 
Josef Hofmann, influenced by the likes of William Morris and Charles René Mackintosh, teamed up with the artist Willemann Moser, and together they established the Wiener Werkstätte, which would produce all sorts of products, architectural facades, furniture, clothing, jewelry, toys, plates, and cutlery, and interiors composed in the spirit of the Gesamtkunstwerk, a total work of art. So here um, we see the reception room that Willemann Moser did for the Fleurger Sisters Boutique, um, Emilia Fleurger was Klim's main model, um, and also his partner. Uh, and then we have a summer dress from Josef Hoffmann. So you see that the aesthetics are just very similar. I mean, you dress like your reception room, um, and you have, you have bosses that match your clothing. And it's a bit ridiculous. Um, and the group manifesto, the Wiener Werkstätte, proclaimed that design should involve a synthesis of new styles with older craft traditions. This would lead not only to an aesthetic enhancement of the consumer's life, but it would also provide a link between the modernist present and the techniques, though not necessarily the appearance, of vernacular craftsmanship. Although the Vienna Bergstudt has sought to establish a program that would lead to greater public access to modern design products, Hofmann and Moser were never under the illusion that all sectors of society would be able to afford their finely crafted objects. Um, although they, you know, always made the argument that they were, you know, very thrifty because they used semi-precious instead of precious mutual <laughs> recreations. Um, and it's with the Wiener Werkstätte that the phenomenon of Wiener Raumkunst, um, which some people translate as interior design, but I like to translate it more literally as Viennese room art, um, became a serious international enterprise. And many of these designers, such as Josef Hofmann, were also active as architects, stressing the significance of composing dynamic structures for living. In this way, architecture and interior design this became the most celebrated and popular visual art form in pre-war Vienna, and it would be an important tool in the transition from imperial rule to Austro-Marxist leadership. While the secessionists in the Wiener Werkstätte were plotting a new living aesthetic for modern Austria, a group of Marxist thinkers were plotting a model for a new Austrian state. As nationalist sentiment, as nationalist sentiment was on the rise throughout the Crown Lands, and with the Emperor Franz Josef celebrating his Diamond Jubilee in 1908, it became increasingly evident that Austria Hungary might not survive that much longer. Meeting regularly in this very historicist space of the Café Central, Rudolf Hilferding, Otto Bauer, Max Adler, and Mark Karl Renner devised a plan for the evolution of the ancient imperial order into a Marxist state. They advocated equal parliamentary representation for the various ethnic groups of the empire, which they believed would overcome the power struggles of nationalist movements. Their ultimate goal was for Austria-Hungary to be transformed into a Nationalitätenstaat, or state of nationalities, providing social equality whilst maintaining the ethnic plurality of the supranational Habsburg model. According to Otto Bauer, for example, in his foundational Austro-Marxist publication from 1907, The Nationalities Question in Social Democracy, Bourgeois social exclusivity manifested itself most powerfully in nationalist phenomena. So I think it's really important to stress here that the continued ideal of transcending the national and ensuring that post-imperial Austria hold on to its um, intrinsically pluralistic shape. And um, I also, just as an aside, I, I'd like to note that there was another prominent Marxist who could often be found playing chess in Café saint while the Austrian Marxists were meeting there. Leon Trotsky, who was in exile in Vienna from 1907 to 1914, wrote the following remark about this group of men in his autobiography, which I think says a lot about the Austrian peculiarity of this movement. He wrote, They were well-educated people whose knowledge of various subjects was superior to mine. I listened with intense and, one might say, respectful interest to their conversation in the Central Café. But very soon I grew puzzled. These people were not revolutionaries. <laughs> when the Habsburg Empire was officially dissolved in October 1918, the Social Democrats, proponents of the Austro-Marxist insistence upon maintaining a multinational Austrian state, found themselves confronted with a much smaller Alpine Republic. Um, and here is a map that draws the boundaries of the successor states. 
The residual Austria experienced economic collapse and widespread hunger. Um, as it was left with the provinces that were the poorest in natural resources and most expensive to maintain. As the architectural historian Yves Blau has described the situation, with the drawing of the new national boundaries, Vienna, where both industry and population were concentrated in the new state, its 1.8 million inhabitants in 1918 represented a little less than one third of the total population of the Republic was suddenly cut off from the essential supplies of coal from Silesia and Bohemia, oil from Galicia, and food produced in Hungary, Moravia, and southern Syria. These resources were now beyond Austrian borders and were inaccessible because of high tariff barriers erected by hostile successor states. The policy of maintaining supranational stability amongst the multi-ethnic population of the empire was thus transposed onto eliminating class conflict in the post-imperial Austrian state. And um, I also want to stress that the Viennese working class was by no means a, an ethnically homogenous group. Um, and I think it was very much representative of the Habsburg imperial identity in terms of ethnicity, uh, while the Viennese middle class at this time identified more and more with German nationalism. So I think we can view this socialist program as an attempt to salvage the multi-ethnic culture of Austrian Hungary. I should also say more generally that in 1920s Austria, there was significant tension between the social democratic capital and the conservative Christian socialist provinces, which would result violently in the Austrian Civil War, War of 1934. Vienna was at this point extremely isolated, it was just its own little bubble, um, especially as its crucial cultural and economic ties to urban centers such as Prague, Budapest, and Trieste had been severed following. is a model from Otto Neurath's Museum for Society and Economy, um, and I'll talk a bit more about that later, but um, it's basically a three-dimensional model with these little pieces, like Monopoly um, little figures. So, um, Alongside food shortages, post-imperial Vienna inherited a massive housing problem that was rooted in the city's rapid population growth during the 19th century. This was made more acute by wartime immigration, the deterioration of old buildings during the war, and the halt to new construction projects. Shortly after the Social Democrats gained control of the city, they embarked on a formidable building scheme to create new affordable housing as well as a new housing culture for those who were to be rehoused or to finally have a place to live. Um, and so the white pieces represent the Gemeinde Balken, um, which are big, dense, urban city blocks, and then the red pieces and settlements, which I'll talk more about. By 1934, um, which by the way is the date that officially marked the end of Red Vienna due to the Civil War and the subsequent Austro-Fascist takeover, 400 Gemeindebauten, or social housing blocks, were built throughout all of Vienna's 23 districts, with 64,000 new living units created in order to accommodate the urban population. In the Gemeindebauten, Workers' housing is incorporated with a wide range of public facilities, including kindergartens, libraries, medical clinics, theaters, sports facilities, cooperative stores, and public gardens. And um, I don't want to go too much into the specific architectural features of these blocks. Um, for that, I will always tell you to look at Eve Blau's excellent book, The Architecture of Red Vienna. But I just want to show you some major examples from very different districts of the city. So. Um, here we have the Weimannhof, which is still within the, in the inner ring, in, in the Gürtel, um, part of the main suburban district of Vienna. The Rabenhof, which is in the third district, which is more of an industrial area. Um, and perhaps the most famous, the Karl-Marxhof, which is um, very much located idyllically um, near the Danube, you know, at the edge of the Vienna woods. Um, and it's also significant for a design facility, which we will come back to shortly. Alongside the mind development, however, another housing movement was taking place, and that was the settlers' movement, in which workers designed and constructed cooperative housing. This was much less about um, having a garden city movement in Vienna, but it arose instead from purely practical circumstances of the food shortages and the need for a lot in gardens. So, um, 
Here we have a photograph of very happy workers building their houses, you see big smiles on their faces. Um, and women also working on the settlement. To complement these massive building projects, the socialist municipal government also developed a strategic policy of interior design. And I just want to briefly lay out some of the administrative structures that were created to ensure that the residents of post imperial Vienna engaged actively and thoughtfully with the furnishing of their homes. This might seem like an odd thing for a local government to invest in so heavily. Um, and this was the bulk of their money was going towards this, these schemes. Um, however, this is connected both to debates on hygiene and the elimination of slums, as well as to the long Viennese tradition of Gemütlichkeit, or culture of cozy relaxation, often in the sociable company of others. An early initiative from 1922 was the idea of Margarete Schütte-Lihowski, who would um, be the only female architect of the Werk von Zillow. And she is perhaps best known today as the designer of the Frankfurt kitchen. And we see the, a reconstruction of that inside. Um, this was designed in 1926 and was the prototype for the affordable built-in kitchen that would become so popular throughout Europe and the United States. Um, and is still very much a fixture in Central European homes. Under the guidance of Schutte-Lihotsky, the Public Utility Settlement and Building Material Corporation set up a goods trust so that social housing tenants could order quality and expensive furniture and other necessary household items. The trust was meant to be a poor man's Wiener Werkstätte, evoking the memory of Vienna's golden era just a decade and a half earlier. Although while craftsmanship and good style were considerations, the emphasis was on collaborating with the design industry to raise the general standard of living of the working class. In December 1929, a permanent interior design center and exhibition space was opened in the Karl Marx Hall, the last of the combined development that I showed you. Um, and it was called Die Beratungsstelle für Inneneinrichtung und Wohnungshygiene des Österreichischen Verbandes für Wohnungsreform, which um, we can translate roughly as the Advice Bureau for Interior Design and Domestic Hygiene of the Austrian Association for Housing Reform. But it was known by its acronym BEST, which I think is a really nice ring to it. So we'll say we're going to the BEST today. Um, the BEST advised tenants on how to furnish their homes in a modern and personalized way, and it hosted exhibitions showcasing new furniture and industrial design. To accommodate worker schedules, the center was open on Fridays, Saturdays, Sundays, and most holidays, and the consultation services and exhibitions were free of charge. The best was also very much based in the pre-war traditions of the Viennese Secession and Wiener Werkstätte. Its director, the architect and designer um, Ernst Lichtblau, had been one of Otto Wagner's students, as well as an early member of the Wiener Werkstätte. So the memory of the imperial Austrian culture was um, being propagated, but with a new veneer of socialism. Yves Blau has noted that before the war, most working class families had been forced to move several times a year and to take in subtenants and bed tenants in order to pay the rent. But now they had a home that they could afford, that they did not have to share with strangers, and that they could count on um, staying in for a long time. For the first time, the Viennese working class tenant had both the opportunity and the need to invest in the dwelling itself, to furnish and decorate it as he or she chose. For many working class families, this process of sort of DIY interior design meant that they would first accommodate the few possessions that had survived the many moves. These were usually historical items, old and cherished family heirlooms. And then they would gradually acquire additional pieces of furniture and other household fixtures at places like the best. Um, so unlike the Wiener Werkstätte brand of bourgeois Viennese interior design around 1900, matching ensembles were neither practical nor advocated. These practices and policies very much emerged under the guidance of this gentle yet boisterous personality, Otto Neurath. Neurath was born on December 10, 1882, to the renowned political economist Wilhelm Neurath, and he studied mathematics, political science, and statistics in Vienna and Berlin, 
after which he became a lecturer in political economy at the Viennese Academy for Commerce and Trade. Immediately following the end of World War I and the subsequent collapse of the empire, Neurath, deeply committed to the social democratic cause, became a leading figure in the Viennese settlers movement. In 1920, he was elected secretary general of the Austrian Association for Settlements and Allotment Gardens, and in 1923, he established the Museum for Settlement and City Planning, which would be renamed the Museum for Society and Economy in January 1925. The museum was without a permanent location, and its mobile nature lent itself especially well to the intended purpose of teaching the Viennese working class about socio-economic developments on both a local and global scale. As he wrote in his autobiography, *From Hieroglyphics to Isotope*, which he wrote、um, in Britain in the early '40s, but it was just published, I think, about two years ago, posthumously.、Um, He wrote, "It all started with a great display. Our association decided to do something to inform the general public about the housing and garden plot movement, and so the somewhat unusual plan developed of arranging a big housing and gardening exhibition in the very center of Vienna. Real transportable houses, fully furnished, were erected on the square before the city hall, and within the hall, exhibits in the long gallery supplied further information." It was as if one were to stage an exhibition dealing with housing and gardening in Trafalgar Square. I thought it advisable to explain housing and gardening, and indeed all kinds of planning, as elements of the whole social fabric, not only of Austria but also of mankind. You know what? Sort of enjoys the status of being a Renaissance man.、Um, he's famous for his mathematical and philosophical projects as part of the Vienna Circle. As well as for developing the pictographic language isotype with the German graphic designer Gerhard Ernst,、um, and here we have some excerpts from his isotype world history, modern man in the making,、um, and then here with the home and factory weaving in England. You know, this is very much representative of the Viennese method of statistics. For purposes, of, for our purposes this evening, however, I'm mostly interested in an understudied aspect of Neurath's work, and that is Neurath, the urban planner and accomplice in architectural endeavors. In 1927, Neurath asked, asked Josef Frank, who had by then achieved great prominence as the architect behind several social housing blocks and as an interior designer, to be the exhibition architect for the Museum for Society and Economy. Frank was born to assimilated Jewish parents on July 15, 1885, in the spa town of Baden-Baden. His father was a textile wholesaler who hailed from the rural province of Hibisch in northeastern Hungary, and his mother was from Bratislava, presently the capital of Slovakia. So his origins were quintessentially imperial. Frank's early exposure to the textile trade and transnational imperial dynamics, complemented by his study of both Western and non-Western art history. And his architectural training at the Technical University, under the supervision of the historicist Karl Koenig, had an enormous influence on his artistic output and theoretical writings. He emigrated to Sweden in 1934, just as the Austro-Fascists had come to power. And today, he is regarded as the father of modern Swedish design. I was in Stockholm a couple of months ago, and it was really interesting to see that he's just really seen as one of their own, and they ignore the fact that he's actually from Vienna.、Um, And it was really—I thought it was quite remarkable the way that he's—he he's,、uh, enjoys William Morris status and the way that renditions of his textiles are marketed in a manner fast approaching kitsch.、Um, he's best known for his pioneering work with the Stockholm-based interior design company Sings Ten, in particular his bold designs that borrow motifs from global cultural and historical sources. And、um, if you want to go to Liberty after this talk, and you go to the top floor, they do have a Sphinx Ten section where you can go and look at some of his textiles.、Hmm. The roots of his trademark aesthetic pluralism, however, were embedded in the multi-ethnic culture of pre-war imperial Vienna, and spread alongside the experimental avant-garde networks of 1920s Central and Eastern Europe. The close association between Frank and Neurath stretched back to the intellectual circles of pre-war Vienna. They probably met. They probably first met around 1908、um, through family members, so Frank's brother and other acquaintances who would later be associated with the Vienna Circle. Before I go.
go into the example of the Bergbundsiedlung, um, which marks the culmination of their collaboration in housing practice and exhibition artwork. I'd like to briefly mention some ideas that Frank expanded upon in his 1931 theoretical treatise, Architecture is Simple, Elements of German New Building. So you can have these in the back of your head while we go through some of the images. With this book, he presented an urgent and scathing critique of modern architectural practices, striving actively against the dogmatic modernism of figures such as Le Corbusier, Walter Copius, and the Bauhaus, and he articulated an alternative modernity that emerged from the multi-ethnic dimensions of the Habsburg Empire. Franck was extremely critical of the avant-garde's prescriptions for stylistic homogeneity, promoting instead a design philosophy that insisted upon individual expressions of sentimentality, and he viewed German national aims towards efficiency with great suspicion. For Frank, it was essential that architecture and design illuminate global diachronic connections in order to arrive at an art of humanity that stressed a pluralistic notion of total design, accomplished through an ever-evolving amalgamation of organic motifs and new interpretations of vernacular sensibilities. Skeptical of the avant-garde's elevation of the cold, untextured metal surfaces of the mechanical and producing a future that precluded engagement with the lifestyles of the past, Architecture is simple called for a modernity that would draw upon ancient Egypt and the Renaissance just as much as it reflects the gentility of the English country house, the coziness of the Austrian Biedermeier, and the anti-ornamentalism of Adolf Loos, while utilizing materials and forms of craftsmanship from China, Japan, and India. Frank proclaimed rather controversially that our time is the whole of the historical time known to us. He demanded that the new architecture be born of the entire non-taste, um, the German Ungeschmack, of our time, its confusion, its colorfulness, its sentimentality, out of everything that is lively and felt. Finally, the art of the people, not art for the people. Franz's disavowal of the artist's genius and his elevation of the masses led to a radical reframing of modern design and its relationship to the past, present, and future. So rather than create a sense of commonality through the, through the streamlined aesthetic of the avant-garde, he sought to combine socialist politics with historical narratives in an attempt to reveal the continuity of natural materials, distinct cultural forms, and humanistic progress in the destructive aftermath of World War I. In working with Frank throughout the 1920s, Neurath began to develop his own philosophy of architecture and interior design, primarily in relation to the execution of Viennese social housing policies. For Neurath, it was essential that modern housing allow working class individuals to achieve a maximum of happiness, he calls it a Glück's Maximum, um, in real as opposed to ideal, modern houses and apartments. And he wrote several essays on the subject, most of which were published by the Daily Arbeiter Zeitung, the workers' paper. Um, and then they also appeared in um, very prominent architectural journals such as Deform. To both Frank and Neurath, the entity of a modern style, expressed, for example, in dominant sets of tubular steel furniture, seemed very old-fashioned and inappropriately rigid for the chaotic diversity of contemporary life. Domestic architecture had to react to the changing needs of the individual. So what may seem to us today as a surprising indication of postmodern concepts was actually in the early 1930s, the polemic articulation of a perception of German modernism as a reactionary force. In 1929, Frank and Neurath launched their plans for a new modern housing estate in Vienna, which was meant as a response to the 1927 Weissenhof in Stuttgart, which showcased a utopian conception of modernity that had its basis in the notion of a single dominant style. Um, and this is a postcard showing the house designed by Le Corbusier in Stuttgart. Um, I should also say that Frank um, designed the house of the Weissenhof which was very, very poorly received, so you can you know, take his bitterness um, as sort of the creative energy that formed to the Bergbundsiedlung. As a stylistic and ideological compromise between the dense urban superblocks and the settlements of Red Vienna, the collaborative task of designing the Bergbundsiedlung fell to the Austrian Bergbund, 
which was a work federation of artists, um, architects, builders, and industrial designers established in June 1912, when the German Werkbund held its annual conference in Vienna. And although these two organizations were meant to be parallel in terms of their focus on quality industrial design products for the masses, I think that the Austrian Werkbund took a very different, perhaps even counter traje trajectory, and this is largely due to the rejection of streamlined modernism in favor of practices that simultaneously embraced the vernacular idioms of Central and Eastern Europe, European folk art, historical forms of design, and the innovations of modern industry. So it should therefore be no surprise that in the 1920s, Josef Frank became the group's vice president and chief international spokesman. Ernst Plischke, a Werkbund member who also worked closely with the best, said that the work of this organization of designers could be defined as such. Our friendship and collective work rests on the following principle. We agree to disagree. Mm -hmm. What the new Habsburg successor states of Eastern Europe gained after the war in terms of cultural expression, political autonomy, and the opportunity to focus on the development of indigenous resources, the remaining Austria was sorely lacking. Viennese designers no longer had the diverse networks and materials that the empire had offered to them, and I would argue that the stylistic diversity of the Austrian Werkbund represented the struggle to hold on to Austrian imperial culture and an attempt to transform those vernacular traditions into a transnational modernity. So the Werkbund, the Austrian Werkbund was a modernist movement, but not in the spirit of the international avant-garde. And this was true from its very inception. It was founded as an institution of design and style reform that was to give a measured and subtle modernism within the framework of the existing imperial state. Um, as Josef Frank stated in a 1929 interview about the Austrian Werkbund, Austria is a small and poor land that is proud when anything at all is accomplished. We are living from a past reputation which we never tire of citing. <laughs> Here is the exhibition poster that was designed by Noira and his team at the Museum for Society and Economy. During the summer of 1932, the International Housing Exposition of the Austrian Bergbund, as the Bergbund was called in contemporary English journals such as Architectural Review at the time, offered working class families in Vienna the opportunity to purchase or rent 70 single family and row homes designed by a diverse group of 31 leading international architects including the likes of André Lossard from France, Gerrit Rietveld from the Netherlands, Margarete Schutte-Lekotsky, who did the uh, Frankfurt Kitchen, and Michael Neutra, who was um, Austrian but was already based in Los Angeles at this time. Here um, we have a photograph of some of the architects gathering on the terrace of the front house. And here is an aerial view of the construction site. And unfortunately, you can't see from the black and white photographs and um, the Verkund Ding is currently being renovated. Um, so you don't, the facades are just really, have really deteriorated. But um, Frank had employed a color theorist to devise a painting scheme based on pastel shades. So the estate would promote a cheerful village-like environment, adding um, this emphasis on personalization. Built under the conceptual direction of both Frank and Neurath, the Werkbundsilung remains one of the most important international exhibitions in the history of modern architecture. And here is a photograph taken on the opening day, 4th of June, 1932. Um, it closed in mid-August, this exhibition, and there were well over 100,000 visitors um, that were recorded. Um, and one of the things that we uncovered in our, we, we just finished an exhibition in Vienna on the Werkbundsilung was a postcard written by Ludwig Wittgenstein um, that he had sent to a friend and it's really funny, it's actually a photograph of him and his sister and a friend walking through the Werkbundsilung and he writes on the back to his friend, you know, oh, I'm just at another exhibition of bloody modern houses. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I should add that although it's really significant, um, it remains virtually unnoticed in the history of 20th century architecture as it is taught and studied today, and it has been omitted on purpose. 
Siegfried Gideon, who wrote the canon of Market modern architecture with his 1941 book Space, Time, and Architecture, was a personal enemy of Josef Frank, uh, mostly due to Frank's subversion of minimalism and aesthetic unity, as well as his refusal to negate 19th century historicism. And Frank also hated Gideon because Gideon criticized his house for the vice of Wolfsey Bill and Stuttgart, so it's all just personal rivalries. Um, by creating an architecture that resisted the categorization and rigid tenen tenets of high modernist thought, whilst being thoroughly entrenched in contemporary aesthetic, political, and technological discourses, the fully furnished model houses of the Vierkonsilum proposed a new and pluralistic definition of modern architecture, one that would engage with both tradition and innovation and, perhaps most significantly, allow for greater agency on the part of the house dweller. In the words of the chief architect, Jos uh, Frank, this housing estate, which is on the outskirts of southwestern Vienna, was designed to show as many architectural solutions as possible to the problem of the small one-family house. For Neurath, this very approach to architecture would result in homes that would consistently provide the maximum of happiness for the working class. To Frank, Neura, and the hundreds of architects, interior designers, and craftsmen, this was a massive undertaking. I mean, they employed you know, electricians, I mean, these were really modern houses. Um, so small Viennese companies, as well as, you know, big international firms coming in. Um, to these people who participated in the project, slogans like mechanization, standardization, the uniformity of style, and in a more general sense, the eight historical anti-traditional tendencies of most modern architects represented a dangerous path in integrating modernity into contemporary culture. The architecture and interior design of the Berkwonsi houses promoted a new way of living that would be available to all people, regardless of class and social standing. In this way, the exhibition called for modern architecture to be deeply integrated into society far away from the abstract concepts of modernity that had until 1932 only been developed and explored in the artistic circles of a small social and economic elite. It was critical that domestic architecture function as a kind of conversation, an enduring communicative act between both the architect and the future inhabitants as active designers of architectural and domestic space. This anti-hierarchical approach placed the architect and the inhabitant on virtually the same level and questioned the authority of the master architect as central paradigm of European modernism. The 19th century conception of the master builder who would construct eternal aesthetic truths was thus replaced by a dynamic process of activities between the designer, inhabitant, architect, and craftsman, and so I think it's fair to call this creative phenomenon modern homes in the making, reflecting um, Altenweirat's book, Modern Man in the Making. The interior designs of the houses on display were in line with Frank's assertions in architecture as symbol. And here again, we have this critique of German modernism. Modern is the house that takes up everything that is alive in our time and thus remains an organically grown structure. Modern German architecture might be objective, practical, right in principle, sometimes even charming, but it remains lifeless. In the Vienna Housing Exposition, the juxtaposition of old and new furniture pieces, as well as the use of brightly ornate textiles, brought the interiors into the real world of living inhabitants a technique that had been advocated by the best initiative I mentioned earlier, and had its roots in the design philosophy employed by Frank in late Imperial Vienna. It was intended that every arrangement be perceived as having been able to come from the inhabitants themselves, as opposed to bearing the signature styles of the prominent designers behind the exhibition. And I just want to show you a few examples of the sort of model home furnishing in the Bergkonsumel. Um, this is the house designed by Josef Frank. Um, very important in the settlement is that the roofs are flat and that there's as much outdoor space as possible. And this is the living room that um, he designed. So for his house he did both the structure and the interior design, which wasn't normally the case for the 70 homes. Um, and just to give you a sense of the colors that he used. So we see the stylistic diversity. We have this big cushy armchair, 
um, you know, very vivid, bold textiles. Uh, this is the secretary that he used. So, I mean, the color is just really, really striking. Um, and what he liked to do, and this is um, a secretary that he designed for his design company, House and Garden, in 1925. And it was actually in his house, um, in the house he did in Stuttgart, in the Weizen Hof Siedlung. Um, he, used, he combined really nice materials with really affordable materials. So he uses Macassar ebony and cherry wood, um, but he sort of works them together with plywood so that the frame of the object um, is more affordable. Um, and then he paints them, which is really, really striking. Um, and it's not just white, it's just some really, you know, vivid spring green. Um, and I think that this is also very classic of Austrian 19th century Peter Meyer furniture with these brass pictures, this very cozy piece. And this is the uh, textile that he used for the bedspread and the curtains, um, and it's called karma. So as I mentioned, he studied uh, non-Western European art as well, so he's very much interested in Indian um, philosophies, Indian textile traditions. Um, and again, the colors are really striking, you know, and it doesn't quite match the green of the secretary, but that doesn't matter. It should be very lively and felt, as he says. This is the living room in um, house number 42, and it, the interior design is done by Ernst Lichtblau um, and the best. Uh, this room is really interesting because around the dining table we see the classic Tonet bandwood chairs that are, you know, a hallmark of 19th century Viennese interior design. Um, with this armchair, which, you know, has a very abstracted um, motif, and if you look at the rug and the upholstery, I'll show you something. Oh, and also you have this utilitarian light bulb hanging from the ceiling. So it's really a combination of all these different styles. But um, if you look at the rug, um, it also is really reminiscent of traditional rug design from the Bukovina, so the easternmost province of the empire. So they're bringing in all these discourses of you know utilitarian modernity with the light bulb hanging, historicist Vienna with the toilet chairs, and um, folk design from Eastern Europe. And this is just an example of um, what the chair looks like. This is actually um, the one that they have in the v &A. and if you have not yet made it to the new furniture gallery, I would highly recommend doing so because they have a really nice little display on donut chairs. Um, but, so they use these, you know, classic models from 1859 by Tonet, but then they also revised them in the Bergkunzilung. And these are actually two chairs that were in the Bergkunzilung, and these are, they were made, um, instead of made out of beech wood, which would have been expensive and difficult to procure, um, these were mostly made out of plywood. Um, so the yellow chair has cane seating, but the blue one is, um, the seat is plywood and then they're painted to sort of bring more cheerfulness into the home. And we can contrast this to the type of furniture that would have been in display in the Stuttgart Weissen Hofsiedlung, and this is Marcel Breuer's, Breuer's um, iconic Vassili chair, also in the Munich Furniture Gallery. Um, so we see this, it's a very big difference. Um, at this point, you were probably wondering where the Anglo part of the title of my presentation comes in. <laughs> and uh, what I'd like to do is just conclude with a brief epilogue to Frank and Norad's work in Vienna. Two years after the Bayern then opened, both Frank and Norad would be forced to flee the increasingly volatile political situation in Austria. Frank went to Stockholm, as I mentioned earlier. He had a Swedish wife, so it was fairly easy for him to leave. But Neurath's escape from Austro fascism was not as straightforward. First, he went to the Soviet Union, then to the Netherlands, and finally he arrived in Britain in 1940, where he settled in Oxford um, and continued to develop his programs of isotype and social housing. And this is a poster display that he made for a housing ex exhibition in London. I'm still trying to track down exactly the details of when and where. This was held, but I think it's really striking that um, 
there's this idea of bringing Austrian social housing to the British sphere um, in the early 1940s, and he draws on both um, the Gemeinde Bauen and the Settlers Movement. The two maintained a close friendship and corresponded regularly, although sadly they were never to meet again. On November 27, 1945, Neuer wrote his last letter to Frank just weeks before his sudden death from a heart attack. In this letter, um, I made a really exciting archival discovery, I think. Um, Neuer was very happy to share the news with his friend that he'd just been invited to be a consultant for human happiness in a place called Bilston, just outside of Wolverhampton. He even had business cards made, which I have seen, they're really great. Just Ulta Neuer, consultant for human happiness. Um, and in this letter, he expressed his desire for Frank to come to England, it's just a really beautiful, heartfelt letter, and embark on an enterprise in the black country that would be similar in style to what they had done with the Bjergbrunzi loan in Vienna. Bilston is in the geographical center of the black country, and it provided a unique opportunity to apply Vienna social housing to a new context. The landscape had become completely derelict and essentially uninhabitable due to its long history of coal and heavy industrialization. In the 1930s, Bilston local authorities started planning major changes in social housing development. Um, and they were very keen to ensure that residents would be able to make the most out of their new estates so that the structures would not degenerate into the post-industrial slums they were intended to replace. And this was a situation not unlike that in Vienna following the First World War. And so Neurath, given his groundbreaking work with municipal social housing policies and the settlers' movement, would have been an exceptionally suitable candidate to guide this program. In 1945, Dr. Robert Abbott, the chairman of the West Midlands Development and Reconstruction Committee, commissioned Otto Neurath to organize an exhibition on housing and happiness. In November 1945, Neurath received a formal invitation to be a consultant for the replanning of Bilston, and the following month he was appointed by Abbott to be a key advisor in the town's health committee, where he would work on issues of health education and rehousing. His sudden death from a heart attack on December 22, 1945, meant that his activities in Bilston could never be fully realized. Nevertheless, his ideas about housing and happiness made their mark on the town and paved the way for future housing projects. Ella Briggs, who had worked closely with Neuer and Frank in Vienna and was the architect of several Gemeinde Bauen, would con um, and she, ended, she emigrated to Britain as well, she would continue uh, their legacy in Bilston by becoming the chief architect behind Stolon. If we see this triangular shape in the corner, this is the aerial view of the Stolon estate. Um, and if you compare it to the plan of the Bjergbundsiedlung, it's very similar in shape. And um, I apologize that I don't have the images of Stolon. I was there a few weeks ago and um, we'll be receiving photographs shortly. Um, but the houses, um, it's very similar in the way that the houses are um, done by different architects. Um, some of the architectural features are very similar. Um, and um, so alongside Ella Briggs, uh, Neurath's widow Marie um, curated mobile happiness exhibitions in shop windows around Milston, which were done very much in the spirit of these exhibitions that her husband and Josef Frank had done in Red Vienna, which I think is really interesting. And I'll just end with a um, photograph of the construction of the houses in Milston. Very much indeed, a, a fascinating talk and connected with all sorts of issues uh, which I think we can ponder not only about history of art and architecture but uh, periodization of art, uh, multi ethnicity, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, we've got a few minutes of questions and then everyone is invited, even those leaving, to, um, <laughs> <laughs> to drink. Uh, Uh, so, okay, so we have to go to uh, any questions from those of us who remain.
Can you have a bit of good information? Um, I haven't heard of the Museum for Society and Economy. Mm -hmm. Are you implied that it was some kind of peripatetic museum or? Yeah. Was it, did it have a building? It did not have a building. It didn't have a main, it, it was a traveling museum. Yes. It was a pop-up museum, you know, for <laughs> contemporary terms. Um, they did have, um, one of their main exhibition uh, spaces was in the Rathaus, that neo-Gothic building I showed you earlier. Um, and one of the interesting things that Josef Rang did was he designed these foldable wooden panels, which were really revolutionary in exhibition design, mm -hmm. so that they could just you know, unfold his panels with the displays um, and fold them back up. And they would take place in various districts throughout Vienna, so that um, it was the idea of bringing the museum to the people so that people could visit. Yeah. Could I say firstly, thank you very much for your fascinating talk, and could I also congratulate you on a wonderful exhibition, which we very Did much you see it? Oh, we had right. Fantastic. <laughs> and um, we were so um, stimulated by it, and we were in doubt to see the um, Fairfield Seagull, which is extremely interesting, I think, from a particularly from an English point of view. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd like to ask you a little bit more about the, the relationship um, which you draw our attention to with later English, but also perhaps earlier English mm -hmm. um, ideas. The, one of the things I was thinking about while you were talking was the manifesto that Frank Pitt wrote for the English um, pavilion in 1937 of the National Exhibition, which was very much focused on the house, its furnishings, the, the, uh, what you would think of in English terms, the arts and crafts products. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I think that has some interesting parallels, which perhaps are precursors to the, well, certainly are precursors to the, to the development of the 1940s. And I wonder if there was any crossover at that exhibition. I, mean, the, I don't the, know that much about that exhibition, but thank you so much for the reference. Yes, um, uh, one thing that I can say is that um, I found a letter that Josef Rang wrote to Architectural Review in 1933, I believe, saying that he'd just been in London and was very impressed by the example of beacon trees. So I know, yes. but that was that was happening parallel to the Bear Yes. Um, There's also something very strange going much further back in English architectural traditions, which yeah. is that when you see the photographs which you had, uh, which we just see again, it has a certain austerity, I would say, yeah. which one thinks of as being an aspect of modernism. When you go now and see it in the landscape, it's this a terrible thing to say. <laughs> but one of the things that I thought of were the part villages, you know, the, 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 the Nash, the Asian region's part, mm -hmm. the winding road, the, the relative. Relative, well, the, low, the small scale, the two, two story house, mm -hmm. the relationship with the landscape. Now, clearly, the relationship with the landscape is something that's happened since, and now it's delightful. And I slightly disagree with you. I think it's, it's, it's very pleasant and bad. <laughs> and the, ones, yeah. the individual ones that are being stored are being stored. Yeah, it's, well. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, there's, so right, when you were talking about the village atmosphere, sentimentality, all of those aspects of the English, English picturesque, which of course do feed in to the to the um, to, to Frank Pips work, which is not only represented by buildings like this, which is very associated. So it seems to me that there's a dialogue going, going on, um, which is which is quite extensive, um, not only in terms of the, of the range of materials, the range of designs, the range of designs. Concepts, but also in terms of the relationship to the building, building to the landscape. Mm -hmm. which, um, which, which, and I wonder if you have more to say about what they actually aspired to at the 1932 exhibition yeah. to, to make not only the inside see livable, but, but, but the landscape outside as well. Um, it was really important for them to have outdoor space, but I think, you know, so there's, um, the houses are very much open on to the landscape, you know, so we see in that aerial 
photo. At that time, in 1932, you know, there are no houses around the back ones even, so it's very much isolated. So you have sort of this village community um, at the edge of the Vienna woods. Um, so it's idyllic yet urban at the same time. Um, but in terms of sort of like the discourses, they don't really write about that particular landscape. And the modern tradition that you mentioned? Yeah, from the settlers' movement, yeah. That, but that doesn't inform. It doesn't. It, I, I sort of see the Bergkunzin as a compromise between the city blocks and the settlers' movement. Um, I, I think in the settlers' movements, you see more far away an engagement with the landscape. There's a German landscape that didn't get there to meet and did work. I mean, you know, they were the settlement. Huh? It's one of these settlers, and you see a fantastic drawing. The house occupies that much space. And you see that much space of drawing devoted to the garden, the lobbies, the chickens, the, the whole the economy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they had they had public gardens in the Bergkunzin, but not allotment gardens per se. Did they have allotments associated with the big um, public housing uh, sort of for, uh, the, the big uh, hall? We do. We do. They have allotments, so they come up. Oh, you mean um, in the in the um, in the big urban yeah. block? You mean they yeah. did have allotment gardens. They did. Yeah. They, did. yeah. they were they were they were uh, I suppose they they were they were uh, yes they were more informed about that they were by the how they just after the war was that deceiving in a sense so it was no longer necessary to grow grow it. Is that it was the. I, yeah, that could be that could be actually because there was that immediate need after the war and by 1932 it wasn't. That dire, to be honest. But you may also be intended for a slightly different group of people. Yes. So I think the Bjarkunzin, because it was experimental, I mean, if you read um, what the architects are saying at the time, who they want to be living in these houses, <laughs> mm. um, they want it to be a place where um, workers can live, but they also want it to be a place where university professors can live and artists and politicians. So that it really is a place where all um, the entire social spectrum comes together. Yeah. And you did a very interesting analysis in your exhibition of the first occupants. I think, in that yes. 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 I to that out yes. On, <laughs> right. It was well, trying to be professional group. It was. It was. Settlers. So I mean, in terms of um, the policy, the socialist policies of Red Vienna, I wouldn't say that the Bergkunz in them was successful. Um, because it because it it was done by all these international architects, the people who ended up buying, for the most part, not everyone, were people who wanted to buy homes built by you know Andre Um well, I, I thought that you had some good raw idea that, it, it, uh, that it, there was an aspiration to continue with the liberal uh, uh, the liberal. Atmosphere of the of the late Hamburg Empire um, by creating a non-national uh, so that style, so that the non-national style was a way of being of continuing the the, the imperial pre-nation state within the new nation state, so to speak. How does that? Um, and, and you talk a lot about how that related to to how things were being done in Germany. Um, how do, how do you think that it related to uh, to uh, uh, to Scandinavia, where there was also a rejection, at least some architects, at least of 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 a naturalism uh, and uh, and there was a yeah. confrontation between the uh, modernists which tended to continue a natural expression. If you look at the uh, main, uh, <laughs> you, you, will, you will see some big, uh, big developments from the 1920s, which are in a vernacular style, very, very, very attractive, mm -hmm. and the big, the big developments which are explicitly in an international style, uh, promoted by the socialists. Do you see those two things coming together at all this time? Well, I just wonder if, I mean, given the sense of what one sees, what one sees, an attempt to create an international, non-national style by a social democratic urban government in a country which hadn't been through that process of national breakdown, or at least they had 150 years earlier. So probably would be in the past. Um, so I wonder if there was something which... Um, I, there's, 
so I mean, this is something that um, I'm really interested in pursuing further um, in the Swedish context, especially because of Josef Trump. Yes. But um, also, I I learned from some architectural historian friends in Sweden that um, a lot of Stockholm urban planning was based on 19th century Viennese principles of historicism and the Vingstrasse, mm -hmm. um, and they were really influenced by the works of the architect Hugo Zitta. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so I think that there there is, there's another dialogue, there's the Austro-England dialogue, and then there's another dialogue going on between Austria and Scandinavia. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that this is also why Frank then was so well received. Well, I think why Frank and Parallel in all the new relationship could be as different because Sweden is very strong, the natural uh, yeah. tribe behind its it's a really sort of democratic uh, push in the 20th century is supposed to create this false camp, mm -hmm. uh, which is, is so explicit and so clearly formulated around the Swedish people taking power from the Nazi aristocrats. Uh, and the, and the, fol the, fol the, the people mess is much less clearly expressed in Denmark. Okay, so I, I, I think that you might find another parallel there. That. Okay, that's good. Cool. Thank you. And another very interesting kind of international comparative social housing studies. Yeah. Uh, mm. uh, less from a social scientist point of view than from your point of view of American history and uh, art institutions and so on. I had a question which is connected with that, too, because you said um, almost in passing that the, um, the working class, which was the base of the year, was in fact very multi ethnic. Yeah. Um, continued to be multi ethnic after the first of all, presumably in rather different ways, and lived that experience differently. Um, did that, that variety of ethnicities in a bottom up sense buy into the idea of a continuing international um, identification of style? Or were, because I'm assuming that multi ethnic yeah, thing yeah. ran, ran into trouble in the 1930s and 40s. So, um, <laughs> so the, 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 the ethnic issues don't go away. No. Uh, and the linguistic issues don't go away. Right. So, uh, so I just wondered how the multi ethnicity of Vienna related, could, did it relate or not to um, the international ambitions and then we the continuing that international ambitions of oh, Austria and of the architects. Um, I think that you see that mostly in interior design, um, like the Ernst room that I showed you, where they take elements of you know the rock from Bukovina. So this is very much present in the in the Bergkontinuum in very very subtle ways, um, and I you know you can't say with certainty what people moving into these houses felt or you know how they associated these objects together. But I think that um, the idea behind this was that. Um, this would be a really comfortable way for a working class person to have some sort of um, aesthetic and cultural continuity with a better time in Austrian history, um, and also maybe be able to recognize some elements of, um, you know, their ancestral homes, you know, going back three, four generations, and see how that could um, work well together with modern internationalism. Okay, how was the multi-ethnicity managed? In terms of, for example, language, mm -hmm. were, uh, what, what was there a continuing um, presence and visibility or audibility of There was, uh, yes. A lot of languages. Were, were there services offered by the city in different languages, or was it just German? Uh, well, I mean, I think, well, I think that, yeah, I think that um, in terms of multilingualism in Vienna, yeah. is that everyone speaks multiple languages. So even if someone is a Czech speaker, they'll be able to get by with German, um, and that, but that also um, inflects the German language at the time as well. So Viennese dialect is just sort of mishmash of all these different languages. Um, but yeah, so I think you know the services would have all been done in German because there wasn't an issue of people really not knowing German or not being able to communicate. And I would assume that if they had gone to the best. You know, someone from Bukovina, for example, you know, and they only knew Romanian or Ukrainian. There would probably be someone around, you know, who's 
grandfather, you know, is half Bukovini, and then they'd know a few words and they'd be able to communicate. Um, but there wasn't sort of like a national language policy. I mean, I mean there were one, one of the things I got from the which I found really interesting was the, because in, in, in contemporary debates even about multilingualism and deep post and mm -hmm. so on and so forth, um, the example of Vienna is often neglected or indeed forgotten by mm -hmm. certain white men, Austrian specialists, and it used to say. And it's a very interesting reminder of that pillar that was particularly infection. If you think about cities in translation, cities of translation, mm -hmm. you know, Barcelona, you know, Calcutta, Montreal, Brussels, etc., etc. Uh, the more that multilingual again tends to get forgotten how yeah. how it affects even the, the German language. Uh, so. And I think one of the things that makes Vienna such a unique example in that respect, you know, you just mentioned Montreal and Calcutta, is that um, I mean, when I think of the terminology that I'm going to use in my work, I always say imperial instead of colonial because it's not a colonial context, and you don't have the same power dynamics, and the empire is contiguous, so the boundaries are more fluid, I think, than you have in other examples. Yes. So there was also a very big tradition of the language switching, wasn't there? Yes, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so people in one part, the other part, some populations more rapidly than others switch language, switch their first language, yeah, exactly. according to what, whatever was economically most opportune. Mm -hmm. So I suppose that that tradition of language which you would have been taken with people into Vienna and you would switch to German because that was how it got. Exactly. And, that's, and, and that was especially true for the Jewish community. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Especially for Jews. Yeah. 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 I mean, there were Jews who switched into Polish, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But I think, um, you know, it's fair to say that most people in the empires could easily speak a three or so this is like an idea which juxtaposes the an ancient imperial order mm -hmm. with a, an investment in modernity mm -hmm. pre-first world war. Uh, to what extent does that manifest itself in the other great cities in the empire? Um, well, <laughs> <laughs> that's a very complicated issue. <laughs> <my> <laughs> um, so let's take the example of Budapest. Right, um, who, you know, and the Hungarians, never, you know, they, you know, rightfully, they refused to acknowledge the Austrian um, emperor as, you know, their ruler. Um, what ends up happening in Budapest, for example, is that there's another really interesting engagement with this, um, with the internationalism and the vernacular, in that the Hungarians, in order to assert their separate identity from the Austrians, they sort of have a sub imperial identity which they then um, transpose onto the different ethnicities of their realm. So this is part of, uh, a process known as Magyarization that happens. But um, the Hungarians, you know, this is a really interesting issue because they're not Indo-European. They don't speak an Indo-European language. Um, and so they're really keen to um, sort of uncover their Asiatic origins. So what you have in, um, modern design in Budapest, you know, it draws very heavily on Turkish traditions, so. Persian, Indian, mm -hmm. um, and incorporating that sort of non-Western internationalism mm -hmm. right. into their brand of modernity. Whereas in Prague, for example, you have, you know, a very strong Czech nationalist movement that would draw specifically on the vernacular um, and work against everything that was going right. on in Vienna. So that doesn't, so that doesn't buy into the, so the, uh, the official, uh, Official investment in international modernity. It's the Viennese version of is just the end. It's just the end. I think you see you see it pop up in um, you know really random cities of the empire. So it's Mishmara where I've done a lot of work mm. in the Banat region of Romania. You know it's known as Little Vienna actually. Um, yeah. yeah, that's very really interesting because I suppose they might have a they might have need for, for expressing the same uh, non national uh, persons because they didn't think about the Hungarian. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so they could have used the international idea for not being Hungarian. And the, yeah, and I think especially in cities like Timishwara or Chernovitz, mm -hmm. where you have um, 
populations that are very similar to what you have in Vienna, where it's, you know, in Prague, it's, you have the Czech population and the German population for the most part. But in Timisoara, you have Romanian, Serbian, Hungarian, German, um, you know, you have a similar dynamic in China, but so I think in those cities, you have sort of a reflection of what happens in Vienna. Can I change the yeah. <laughs> uh, observation then? Um, thank you very much. I enjoyed it terribly much. And, um, I'll be in Vienna in a week's time, so I should. Well, sadly, so the exhibition is no longer. Oh, well. <laughs> but you should go to the city museum. Go to a, 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 yes. <laughs> okay, there, there is a walking tour up of the Bergkunzibung. I don't know if you've, if you've discovered this. Um, but, yeah. Well, well, I've always heard it. <laughs> I can't think of it. Actually, a terrible expression, the elephant in the room. It seems that the elephant in the room is Adolf Lewis. And you mentioned him. I know, I just wanted to take it away. But, um, anyway, and I, I didn't know that much about France, so I'm, I'm indebted to you for that. But, but there must, be, must have been a very close affinity between Frank and you. Of course, Lewis died in 1933. Yeah. Well, Lewis actually, Lewis designed a house in the Berkman. Yes, he yes. yes. But, the, but the, the, the idea, Lewis's idea, Lewis was a vehement opponent of this art and if right. um, you see Lewis's interiors, there's a bit of this, a bit of that, a piece of furniture, a church carpet, there's a whole, uh, as yeah. you seem to get in, in France, the interiors. Yeah. So, so the, I was struck by this uh, similar, similar. There is, I think, um, there, a lot of people have commented, there, it's very similar. I mean, Franz Berg, um, of course, is more colorful than Lewis's work. Um, so I think the journal aesthetic is different, but I think that the idea is um, it's the same. And one of the first things that Lewis, and I took it out of this paper for reasons of time, but one of the first things that Lewis did um, after the collapse of the empire in 1918 was he wrote an essay for a journal called The Peace, and it's called um, Directives for an Art Commission, in which he sort of outlines what the new art is, should be for the First Republic, and what he says really reflects Franz's practice before the war as well, in terms of juxtaposing all these different mm -hmm. elements. So it would be against more of the left by the Arbeitsrat in Germany, would be mm -hmm. against that position? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. But thank you for bringing up those. <laughs> <laughs> Right, well, I think we'll, we'll end there. We're now all invited to uh, have a drink um, in the lobby in the, the lift, so on, on this floor. Um, so let's do that uh, informally about this fascinating material, but to meet time, thanks for being again. Mm -hmm.